So this has been a lot of fun. I've, I've, I've learned a lot of things I didn't know, and it's been a while since I've been at a meeting where every day was something I, I had never heard of before. Um, so, so I'm a Beamline guy. I, I live at uh, this, this instrument called 34IDC at the APS, and uh, we do these experiments where we measure data like this uh, that we've been talking about all week, and we invert it to images. I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about, about that whole process and, and sort of what's special about the way we do it at, at 34IDC. Um, so, so this is what we've been talking about, of course. You put some kind of coherent beam or some type of beam onto a sample. There's a scattering that's done an interference pattern forms you use these phase retrieval algorithms to then to then uh, get, get an image of the sample um, at 34 IDC we do have a, a fairly unique way of doing this um, uh, we, we, we tend to look at small crystalline objects and if the object is crystalline the uh, Fourier transform of that will have a, a lattice associated with the real space lattice and in reciprocal space we'll go out to some region of reciprocal space around one of these Bragg peaks and uh, when it's interference maxima, and we'll measure the scattering in the vicinity of that Bragg peak. And then again, just phase that with the, the typical iterative algorithms and, and look at images of these little crystalline objects, uh, again, with a fairly unique um, contrast mechanism. So because these are, uh, I'm already talking really fast, because these are uh, uh, methods based on phase retrieval, we're really sensitive to the phases that are added to the scattered beam. And you can imagine a crystal that, that might be represented by this black lattice and then a part of the crystal represented in blue here would be slightly distorted um, away from the lattice of the black uh, crystal. And, and so as the beams come in and reflect off the planes of these two regions of the crystal, the regions that reflect from the blue will be slightly, or the rays that reflect from the blue will be slightly out of phase with the rays that reflect from the black. And it's those phases that we are sensitive to in, in the coherent diffraction experiment. And, and they're, they're directly proportional to the distortion field that that is uh, uh, present in, in the lattice of the crystal. Um, and so, so one consequence of that is that if you have something like this, this green crystal, uh, where the lattice planes in the horizontal here are all evenly spaced and there's no distract, dis distortion, if you reflect off of those planes, you see no additional phase structure. But if you reflect off of the planes where there is distortion, now there's going to be a phase uh, associated with the, the different regions of the lattice, and we'll be able to image that distortion. So, so the, the, the summary of this is that we're, we're sensitive to a distortion of the lattice field um, known as U, and we're only sensitive to a projection of that distortion field uh, projected onto the reciprocal lattice vector that we're measuring, on, onto the momentum transfer vector that we're measuring. So, so we get a single component of the strain within the crystal. And, and so in order to then image like the whole strain field, we'd have to measure multiple reflections from the same object and put those images together to form a, a three-dimensional visualization of the vector field that describes the, the distortion of the lattice. So these experiments actually do look uh, pretty much exactly like this. We take a little crystal and we put it at the center of a diffractometer. We uh, send a coherent X-ray beam onto it. We put a, an X-ray camera, an area detector of some type out in reciprocal space at the right angle for the reflections from a, a particular set of lattice planes in the crystal. And then what we do is we, uh, we find that, that signal and we just rotate the crystal through a very small angle in the reciprocal space so the crystal rotates. And as that happens, the, the three-dimensional volume of reciprocal space sweeps through the detector and, and we measure a movie that looks like this. And then the, the thing we do with the uh, data is we stack it together into a three-dimensional volume of reciprocal space where the, the Bragg peak is in the middle and all the coherent interference is around it. And we feed that three-dimensional volume of data into a phasing program and all pops images that look something like this. And, and, and when uh, I have electron micro microscopists in the room, I always point out that the electron microscopy is better um, because I don't want them to get mad at me. Um, but, the, the key to this is that we can look inside the crystal. So, so this slice here that's colored um, through the volume of this, uh, this little cube here is not a, a slice in the amplitude, it's a slice in the phase. And so this color is telling us what's happening to the lattice projected onto this reciprocal lattice vector that was, uh, that was measured um, as a function of position within the crystal. So the red here is telling me the lattice is expanded. The blue down in this corner is telling me that the lattice is expanded but anti-parallel to the Q vector. And then this orange up here in this corner is also telling me that the lattice is stretched, you know, parallel to the Q vector. I don't know anything about the perpendicular direction from this single measurement. Um, I'd have to measure another reciprocal lattice point in order to be able to get sensitivity to the, to the other direction. 
Um, so the experiment really, uh, this is what it looks like. If you've never been to one of these facilities, uh, 34IDC is uh, the name of this, this lead-lined uh, lead room. It's about two-inch thick lead walls, and the X-ray beam comes straight out this wall and onto the sample sitting right there at the center of this diffractometer. Um, it would be sitting right on top of this sample stage here. We got a nice microscope for imaging where it is in, in real space and lining it with the X-ray beam. That's uh, focused by these mirrors here with about a 70 millimeter working distance. So that gives us a lot of space here to do in situ experiments. We can put little chambers there and flow toxic gases and heat samples to 1,000 degrees C and, and uh, shoot lasers at them and stuff like that. Um, and then we can orient the sample using these motorized stages from, you know, that we can control from anywhere in the world. And then the detector lives out here on this, uh, this arm. And we can motor this detector forward and backward because one of the, the key uh, components of these data sets is that they have to be oversampled. You need to get every feature on one or two pixels in order to be able to uh, phase the data sets. And so we need to be able to motor the detector forward and backward. And I always tell users that the biggest sample they can bring is about two micrometers in size. Because if a sample is two microns in size, in order to oversample its diffraction pattern, I have to have this detector about three meters away from the sample. And if they bring a two and a half micron sample, it will have to have the detector floating in space up in the corner, and a four micron sample, the detector is going to be you know, somewhere outside the room. So, so we can fit about a two micron sample in this 70, uh, 70 millimeter space here. Um, so we, we do the phase retrieval, which I guess is what most of us want to talk about. We do the phase retrieval using these old fashioned iterative algorithms from, uh, from Gertzberg and Saxton and Jim Feenup and, and, and that whole crew. Um, we have a package for it, it's called Cohere. Um, it lives on GitHub and it's developed by a woman named Barbara Frostick. I think it's about 80% of her job. Um, and, and she does a pretty good job of maintaining documentation for it and there's a whole user interface for it and a GUI and an example data set that you can get off of GitHub if, if you want to play with it. Um, one thing I wanted to point out that I think was important in, in our development of Cohere was we realized that these toolkits are changing all the time and it was hard to keep up with them. Um, you, you know, as soon as you get something working in array fire, array fire would change and, and it would break. And, and it was really frustrating to, to keep up with these things and, and what would come in and out of fashion. So what we did is abstracted Cohere away from all of these toolkits and we just created a, an abstract library called Colib and then we have specific implementation for all these other, all of these toolkits, which is quite nice. So you can, you know, if you can get Kupai working on your Linux box, you can use Kupai. That's our default now. It's really fast. If you can get PyTorch working on your Mac, you can use PyTorch. And, uh, and it really makes maintenance of this quite, quite comforting because we're not tied to a single toolkit. And if one of them just goes away, um, we're, we're going to be okay. Um, so, so these are the algorithms, and yeah, I'm moving pretty fast. This is great. Um, so yeah, we all know this. We, uh, we go between direct space and reciprocal space using a, an FFT, and, uh, and we just do stuff in both of these spaces. And uh, we've been talking about this idea a lot. You have this compact support idea. Um, the dynamic range of this projector is quite bad, but there's kind of a ghostly shadow around this little cube um, that identifies the support. And, and, and we just do different things inside and outside of the support. Um, <clears throat> We, we, we do use one of these tricks that Stefano invented back in 2003, or at least he wrote the paper. It's called shrink wrap. And the idea is, is that you start the, the phasing, and you start the iterations with this box, and you're doing the iterations, and then you stop, and you say, okay, now I'm going to look at where there's intensity. I'm maybe going to convolve that image with a Gaussian, threshold that Gaussian, and then binarize that and call that my new support. So you're basically shrinking the support down around the object. And then you keep running more iterations of the phase, and then you stop again and you do another iteration of this shrink wrap and eventually your support wraps nice and tightly around where the image is forming and it really helps kind of clean up the, the fidelity of the image. Um, so that's all implemented in, in Cohere and it's you know, something like three or four parameters. So the parameter number just starts to, to escalate ridiculously with these algorithms. Every time you implement a new idea, you add a few more parameters to the configuration file for the, for the programs. Um, we also have this, this thing called detwinning. So the, one of the pathologies of, of these phasing problems is that you, you have this, this twin image uh, problem where the centrosymmetric complex conjugate of the image is a solution to the phase problem. So, so these two are, are valid solutions to the problem. A linear combination of these two is a valid solution to the problem. And Jesse Clark, who was one of the, the sort of like creative workers in, 
in the field a number of years ago, came up with this idea to get rid of this possible superposition of these two images that could really stagnate the phase retrieval. And I don't understand how it works. But what he does is he just keeps a quarter of the image. So you just keep the top left corner of the image. You set the rest of it to zero, and you do a single loop through the uh, phasing program. And what comes out is an image that is pure. It only has one or the other twin. And then from then on, it's only phasing and improving the fidelity of one of these two images instead of a superposition of them. Um, so that's implemented and cohere with a, you know, a single iteration, you know, a, you know, iteration one or two of, of your phasing. And, and it really seems to speed up the, uh, the convergence of these things. And it, uh, it's just one of those features we have. Um, these are the basic ideas. You know, we have a couple of other um, variations on this theme implemented in the programs, but you know, error reduction and HIO were, were straight out of uh, Jim Phenop's 1982 paper, where you know, in, in error reduction, you just leave the image alone inside the support at what comes out of this Fourier transform, and you just zero what's outside the support. Um, hybrid input output, you, you leave the bit inside the support alone, and then you do this mixing operation between the current image and the previous image with some mixing parameter. So now I think that's parameter four in our, in our program. Um, to, uh, to you know, kind of control the convergence of, of this algorithm. Um, and I think in, in Jim's paper in 82, he said beta is good between 0.7 and 0.9, and we set it at 0.9, and, and I don't think anybody ever changes it. Um, I, I, this might be my entire contribution to the field of phase retrieval. Um, in, in 2010, I wrote this paper where I identified this idea of a phase constraint. So you can just start tacking extra things onto these algorithms. And I, I tacked on this constraint that if our crystal isn't very strained, if there's not a lot of phase structure expected in the crystal, you can have a constraint on that image. Um, so inside the support, if the, phase is, uh, if the phase is less than some range, you leave the image alone. If the phase falls outside of that range or if it falls outside the support, you, you do the feedback operation. And, and this really dramatically improved the, the phasing for crystals that don't have a lot of strain, where, where the phase structure is not that strong. Um, and then a, a couple of years later, Xiao Jing started looking at why this was working really well. And, and it sort of became obvious when he started looking at the propagation of the wave after it leaves the crystal. So, so if you have a, a wave without very much phase on it, it's got a relatively flat, flat phase structure and it propagates away from the crystal a very little distance. It picks up a lot of phase from the propagation. And so essentially by fixing this phase in the, uh, in the image, what you're doing is fixing the back propagation distance very rigidly. So you're saying that the crystal is, you know, this far away from the detector and you can't go forward or backward because, you know, if you move a little bit closer to the detector, you've got a strong phase structure, but it still satisfies the reciprocal space constraint. So it's still a solution to the problem. Um, and so that's why a tight support works, but this phase constraint works as well as a tight support and, and is essentially equivalent to a tight support um, if you can apply it to your, your uh, you know, your, your iterations. Um, and, and so that, that's quite a powerful constraint and you don't really even need a support at all if, you're, if you can apply this, this phase constraint with a, a fairly high uh, knowledge of, of what, the, what the range is. Um, so, it, and then in reciprocal space, everybody uses this, uh, this idea of applying the phases. And so you take the Fourier transform of your current image you get a set of phases, you take the experimental amplitudes, you combine those together, you keep looping around. I, I was talking to Min this week in his poster and he convinced me that we should probably start doing these, uh, these proximal smoothing uh, ideas that he implemented uh, years ago. And, uh, and I think I'm gonna go home and, and add this to Cohere because it should be a pretty easy addition and see if it starts helping, um, helping use the data a little bit more effectively. Um, Another thing that Jesse implemented is uh, this idea of partial coherence. So you don't always have a perfectly coherent beam at a synchrotron, and, uh, and, and 34IDC is no different. Um, he, uh, Jesse started looking at the data and saying, you know, if I could come up with some some estimate of the, the mutual coherence function, I, I would be able to correct for it by modifying my reciprocal space constraints. So the square root of, of i is my, uh, is my data, and then this, uh, this uh, estimate of the, of the incoherent uh, wave uh, could go on the bottom, and the phases come from the Fourier transform of the image. So I, I could combine things in this way if I could come up with a, a, an estimate of the, of the coherence function. And he just tried the Richardson-Lucy deconvolution, and it worked 
worked quite well. So you take a Fourier transform of the image, you take the data that you measured, you feed both of those into these deconvolution algorithms, and out pops a function that's the blurring function between those two images or between those two, two uh, reciprocal space data sets. And then that, that coherence function is then applied in our reciprocal space uh, algorithm or reciprocal space operation for, for a number of iterations. And then we perhaps update it you know, every five or 10 iterations and that's dramatically improved uh, the images that we get. Here, here's an example where we were intentionally messing up the coherence of the beam line. Um, so you can adjust slit sizes and you can let uh, you know, your less coherent beam come down onto the sample. And so if you look at the, the visibility of the interference pattern in, the, uh, in reciprocal space, you can see with the slits opened up, the visibility goes away. You don't get the deep, uh, the deep minima in between the fringes. Um, in the horizontal, in the vertical, you still get them because our, our source is very coherent in the vertical. Um, and then we found that using this, uh, this coherence function, uh, we get much sort of more smoother images from these, these incoherent beams. And then this is like line outs uh, through the three dimensional uh, estimate of the coherence. Um, um, uh, it was uh, present in the beam, both in the, the closed slit and open slit um, um, case on the, on the beam line. Um, so that's implemented with about another three or four parameters you have to figure out. Um, he also, Jesse, <laughs> Jesse really added a lot to our, our, our sort of capabilities. He also added this idea of an expanding low pass filter. So we'll, we'll start the phase out retrieval algorithm with a low pass filter data set where we just, uh, you know, you just basically multiply it by a Gaussian and you start phasing this low pass filter data. And then every iteration you make the Gaussian a little bit wider. And you do that for maybe half of the iterations that you're phasing. And this also improves a lot the, the sort of robustness of the phasing because you, know, you think about it, these dim signals are higher, higher noise and you don't necessarily want them contributing to the image when you don't really know what the image is. And so, so by slowly uh, increasing the data that you add to the, to the phasing algorithm, you, you can improve the, the sort of convergence rate of the algorithm. And, and so that's implemented with a few other parameters. Um, like I said, we got a lot of parameters in the programs. Um, so that's implemented now and, and, and it's used you know, sort of as a thing to try when you're running, running the phasing programs. So, so this is what we do. We, we basically start with a data set that we measure at the beam line, and this is a, a really nice version of, of a data set. And, and we start running these, these algorithms. And what we do is we switch in between them. So you'll start with an error reduction algorithm, and it's, it's a steepest descent, so it goes down to some local minimum. Switch to HIO. This was me playing with a couple of different versions of HIO and ER. Uh, the, the, the error metric then goes up as a function of iteration, and you know essentially the algorithm's exploring the space a bit. And then and you, you switch to ER and you go down to another local minima and then as you know these cycles go back and forth uh, and you get to lower and lower points and then you could either watch this as a convergence criterion and stop at a certain point or you could just run too many iterations and, and the thing will be done um, effectively and you just stop at that point. This currently with a data set like this is you know sort of like 10 seconds on, on our modern GPU so, so it goes really fast. This is quite a small data set um, even a, a relatively big data set is still like you know a 10 minute endeavor um, depending on the bells and whistles you've turned on in uh, in cohere um, this is the other uh, uh, big contribution from Jesse before he left science. He, he developed these ideas of, of a genetic algorithm so this was based on some work John did um, She's 2007 now. He called it a guided hybrid input output algorithm. And Jesse took this idea and kind of cast it more into a genetic algorithm um, um, sort of you know, framework where you start with a bunch of random images and you run these iterations of HIO and ER and, and you get some result and then you, you calculate some fitness metric. Uh, that fitness metric could just be the reciprocal space error. So you pick the one with the best error. Uh, one we actually use quite a lot with crystals because you expect their density to be flat, they're, they're crystals after all, we, we look at the sharpness. So we do the sum of the density to the fourth power and the crystal with the minimum of this would be the best crystal um, or the best image. And then you can use that as the sort of alpha and then you breed all of the other population with that one alpha one using some kind of crossing operation. And then you, you, you create a whole new set of individuals and you feed back into more phasing. And, uh, and Barbara's done a good job of parallelizing Cohere that this runs 
runs almost as fast as a single, single reconstruction because she can feed you know, so many of these to each of the GPU cards and they all run at the same time on each of the GPU cards. And so you, you know, 10 seconds for one is, is you know, maybe 15 seconds for all of them. Um, so you can really go through these generations quite quickly and uh, you're only limited by the memory on the, on the cards and the number of cores in the cards. Um, so that, that's also implemented, and this has been getting improved a lot in the last year. We've been making it faster, and she's now starting to learn MPI so we can parallelize it across machines and run huge populations and increase the sort of diversity of solutions that we all, you know, combine together to form images. Um, you know, a lot of this isn't based on, on us knowing a lot of math or optimization. It's based on us just trying things and saying, yeah, that worked better. And so you know, help in the, in the world of, you know, try this instead of that would, would be helpful. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, about the things that don't work and the problems we have. And, and that's kind of what I want to focus on because I'm in a room with a bunch of smart people. Um, one of the problems we have with this data is it's quite often to find a nice isolated coherent diffraction pattern. So in this data set, this thing at the middle here is the, is the signal we're interested in. That's the one that we want. And you can see these connected fringes that come up and come together and then sweep away. That's all connected to the crystal that I'm interested in. But on the detector, you see there's, there's other signals. There's a thing lighting up up here. There's things lighting up down here. There's a thing right there. These are all things that are other crystals. And so there are other crystals on the edge of the X-ray beam that are slightly misoriented. And they're sending a signal to the detector as well. And right now, we have two ways to deal with that. One of them is to open this data set in image J and go through frame by frame and literally just paint out the stuff that you don't want to include in the data set. Um, and that takes a lot of time. Or we, we have a very simple sort of cluster-based algorithm developed by Kenley, um, which goes through and looks at, at clusters in the, in the data set in three dimensions. And then not only does it look at where the clusters are, it looks at their asymmetry. So, so you know, this thing up here won't have a, a matching uh, friend down here, so it's considered to be asymmetric and, and away from the center, so it would be deleted. And we go through the whole data set with this clustering algorithm, and, uh, and it works pretty well when there's a good separation between these things we call aliens and, and the thing that we're interested in. Um, that doesn't always happen. So here's, here's a worst case. Um, so this is the data set that we're interested in, this thing in the middle here. And then there's something lighting up up here, which is nice and separated. And Kenley's program would find that. But you can see as the program goes by, there's these two streaks that come shooting through that one and that one. So that's, that's an alien. That's from another crystal. The Bragg peak for that crystal would be off the detector somewhere down over here. But we need to get rid of that in order to, to run the phasing programs. The consequence of leaving these kinds of signals in the algorithm means you get ripples in real space. So two points in reciprocal space lead to ripples in real space. So it really hurts the fidelity of, of our images to leave all this stuff in there. And right now, we would have to clean a data set like this by hand. Uh, to be honest, what we probably do is spend more time just trying to find a different crystal that has a better isolation uh, from, from the other things around it. And so you're, you're wasting time on other, either side. Either you're making your data analysis easier or you're uh, making the experiment a little bit more effort. Um, this is an even worse case scenario. This is a sample where there's, there's a, a lot of, uh, I think this is one of Ian Robinson's experiments actually. There's a lot of uh, a very small particles on the sample. I think they were barium titanate crystals and there was tons of little ones on the sample. And then there's like ones that are kind of large and giving really nice signals that you want to measure and do an experiment on. But because this is riding on this sort of bright powder ring here, it's really hard to, to get reliable images from a data set riding on this kind of background, which is uh, very random and, and somewhat unpredictable. Um, this is another thing that we completely ignore. And uh, I think Manuel on Monday hinted at this a little bit, this idea of amplitude contrast. Um, because we're forming our images from phase retrieval, we don't have very good reliable um, amplitude contrast, at least in hard x-rays. Um, so, so this is an interesting experiment. Um, we were trying to do these dichroism experiments that Manuel talked about on Monday with magnetic structure. And we had a postdoc named John who was working on, on this uh, experiment with us. And this was a, a little gold crystal that was measured and he didn't do anything. He just took the data set from the gold crystal and started working on phasing it, trying to see how, how accurately 
he could get the amplitude image to reproduce. And, and the best he could do at the time, this was a number of years ago, the best he could get at the time was something like a 20% like a contrast in, 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 in these two images. These are from the same data set. So, so you can imagine if you had two different data sets measured from the same crystal and you were trying to image a contrast, a magnetic dichroism that's like 15%, it would be a, a, a difficult uh, story to tell if you can't even image the same crystal uh, twice with a, a contrast of better than, than 20%. Um, I, I did keep trying with the data set after John left, and, and I was able to get something that I thought looked pretty reliable. So if there is a, a magnetic structure in this, what's red in this image with the, the right-hand light should be green in this image with the left-hand light, and vice versa. The red there should be green there. And I did get that to show up. Again, this is actually in three dimensions, but I'm just showing 2D slices. Um, but the way I did it was I, I used a trick. What I did was I fixed the phases. And so, so what we had was we had several data sets measured at different energies across the absorption edge. And it's only this one energy that should really show the dichroism. And so my, my trick was, well, 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 I'll phase all 10 data sets at the same time and I'll force their phases to all be the same because it's the same crystal, should have the same strain. And so I'll force the phases to be the same and I'll only let the amplitudes change um, in, in, in the images. And, uh, and I did get this thing that I thought was a pretty reliable sort of contrast inversion at the right energy. But uh, it actually, it had the effect of, of amplifying the, the, the contrast. This is greater than it's supposed to be. And, uh, and it's because there's actually a phase component to this dichroism that's not shown in a plot that's only a plot of the intensity. But, uh, but I forced the phases to be static, so I think I amplified the, uh, the amplitude contrast. Um, this is another thing that doesn't work well for us. Um, we're often doing experiments on things like batteries, and so this was a, quite a nice work by Andrew a number of years ago where he was watching a lithium ion particle, um, a battery particle, inside a battery as it was charging. And so we're watching this particle uh, as the battery's charging, and what you start to see represented by these lines here are dislocations that formed in the lattice. So these are just defects in the lattice. And as the crystal was charging, these defects were moving through the lattice. And at some point, those defects started to go away, and they started to go away at a phase transformation. So the crystal was, was literally changing its structure. It was going from one lattice structure to another. Maybe atoms were moving around inside of the unit cells of the crystal. And you start getting a, a significant uh, diffraction signal at a completely different angle in reciprocal space. And, and he was able to continue doing the imaging of this crystal for a while as that phase transformation was nucleating and starting to fill the crystal. But at some point, the data set that's just got to the point where the phasing programs didn't work. Um, so this is maybe when it's at about a 50-50 state where the phase transformation had, had taken over about half the crystal. I'm just saying that because it looks like half the intensity is at each of the two uh, reciprocal lattice places. And our, our current phasing programs can't deal with a data set like this. And, uh, and we haven't had any success in, in you know, any of our, our sort of standard uh, methods to, to invert a data set like this to an image of the crystal. That's going to be very complicated. There's going to be a lot of strain. Um, there's going to be essentially two different lattice constants in it. And, uh, and we, we can't currently uh, manage something like that. Um, here's another one of Ian Robinson's papers that I'll, I guess I'm, I'm picking on him when he's not here. Um, this was a, a set of data of uh, LBCL that was, uh, it was cooled down to a, below its transition temperature. So it goes through another one of these structural phase transitions. And the question was, as you cycled it above and below its transition temperature, did it reproduce? Did it come back to the same sort of domain structure um, in, in these, uh, these different phases? And, and most of the paper, fortunately, is really about looking at the actual diffraction patterns and comparing the structure and the diffraction patterns and, and coming up with some correlations about you know, whether or not the the structure is reproducing as it as it goes above and below the, the transformation. Um, but but he did it, uh, actually produce images from from one or two of these data sets, and and then talk a little bit about the sort of domain structure that you're seeing in the reds and the blues here. And uh, and he even admits in the paper that that this was highly dependent on the phasing. Uh, 
parameters you use. So, so, so you could get a stable solution. You could get the same image every time you ran the program, or roughly the same image, if you, if you found this set of parameters that, that behaved like that. So you know, the support, the shrink wrap, the, the low pass filtering, maybe the genetic algorithm parameters. You could get a fairly stable solution. But uh, if you changed any of those parameters, you would get an unstable solution. So you run the program three times, you get three different images. Um, so that happens a lot with data sets like this, where there's no sort of central focal brag peak, you know, in, in a little perfect gold crystal without much strain. In reciprocal space, we get this nice bright sort of central maxima, and then all the interference is around it. And I get perfectly 10 minutes. Um, and, and, and so this is a data set that doesn't have that, and, and we think those are the data sets that typically are the hardest to phase for us. And getting images from them doesn't really work. Um, th this was me just playing around at the Beamline one afternoon. We had a user that brought these heavily, heavily destroyed um, crystals. And we were measuring data sets like this. And, and, and he actually spent a lot of time getting you know, the same kind of deal that Ian did, where he could do phase retrieval on these data sets and get sort of reproducible, reliable images. But this was just me playing around at the Beamline during the experiment. And without playing with any of the phasing parameters, just using the defaults that, that are in the coherent program, I just hit play four times on the program and got you know, these four different images. Um, I mostly just did that to make this slide. Um, so so you know, th this is a problem that we, we run into all the time, that, that we have a lot of data sets that we can't currently really do anything with um, without a lot of effort. And, uh, and, and it, it kind of gets in the way of doing science. Um, I think maybe I won't say a whole lot about beam damage other than that it happens. We got a really bright x-ray beam and we got chemistry happening on the surface because of that bright x-ray beam. This is a silicon on insulator structure that's evolving in time just sitting in the x-ray beam. You can see the Bragg peak. Uh, there's the little crystal and you can actually see a mark across it where the x-ray beam is depositing garbage on the sample. And uh, you can see that a huge strain develops in the crystal by how, you know, sort of distorted the reciprocal space pattern gets. Um, and then Xiaowen actually, when she was working on this data, this was part of her thesis, came up with a, a model-driven phase retrieval where she could actually, I guess I'm saying a lot about it, she could actually do some modeling of the expected uh, distortion in the silicon um, because she figured out what the damage model was and then she was able to actually invert these to images based on, on, a, on a model. Um, Another problem we're going to have in the APS upgrade, actually what I wanted to talk about with this was this idea that we actually don't use a lot of data. So, so this was a study that, uh, that Matthew and I worked on a number of years ago. We, we took a, a gold crystal and we just measured it all night. We were tired, we set it at the center of the diffractometer and said just go. We just measured it again and again all night. And, and we would measure it for maybe a half hour and then realign it and we did that 25 times. Um, in, the whole, in the whole night only about three and a half hours of actual x-ray exposure happened, but we were able to then uh, sum up those 25 separate measurements and get a really nice data set. And at the time, which I think this still is the best data set we've ever measured at 34ID, um, we, we were able to then phase this diffraction pattern to get a nice high resolution image, where in some directions the resolution's kind of four nanometers, in other directions it's sort of sub 10 nanometers. Um, the thing that's depressing about this though, you can run the phasing on this 10 or 20 times. You can, you can compute what's called the phase retrieval transfer function where you take these separate uh, phased images before you transform all of them and you just add them all together. And where the phases um, add up constructively, you can say those are accurately phased uh, amplitudes. But outside of this white line are where the phases don't add up. They, they add up destructively, which means they're randomized. And, and as a result, we're not really using a lot of the data. So if the if the projector was better, you'd see there's fringes going way out here. And, and in principle, those are all very high resolution signals that are not contributing to the image. And, and so finding ways to, to sort of expand the algorithm and get it to use more of the, of the sort of low signal to noise data um, would, would perhaps improve our imaging capabilities quite a lot. Um, and then what else did I want to say? Um, yeah, this is just saying that resolution really does go like time to the minus four. Chris said that this morning. Uh, you have to keep measuring longer and longer and longer to build up a signal at high, high Q, and that directly uh, converts to the resolution, and we saw that in this, uh, 
in this data set. Um, so we are planning this, this major upgrade to the APS where there's going to be a, you know, a, couple, of, a couple of hundred times more coherent flux. And so I've started to, to play around a little bit with measurements we might be able to do then that we can't do today. This was a really simple simulation of a, of a sort of 50 nanometer gold crystal. Um, it was relaxed with molecular dynamics. And I was putting our sort of expected coherent flux onto the sample. So you know, 10 to the 12 photons per second. I'm not worrying about the fact that it's probably going to melt. But, uh, but I was just putting that flux onto it and I was computing the signal that we could expect uh, as we scan from the 002 Bragg peak out, at, out to the 004 Bragg peak in reciprocal space and looking at the types of signals we'd be able to uh, acquire across a huge detector. So this detector is, uh, is something like 16 times the size of our current detector. And, uh, and this would all be a very phasable signal. And on top of that, it would be atomic resolution data, at least in one direction. Um, so when you scan from the 002 and you cruise all the way out here in reciprocal space to the 004, which lights up there, that's telling us that we have uh, you know, sensitivity to the individual lattice planes in that direction in the lattice. And so, so this is a very high resolution data set that is the kind of thing we might be able to measure. Um, this simulation is about 30 gigabytes and our typical GPU cards are half that much. So even being able to phase a data set like this is going to be a bit of a struggle. We have to do better. I, I think I'll skip this, but I tried to measure that kind of data set at 34 IDC uh, last year. We had a really well aligned crystal. And what you saw leave there was the 111 Bragg Peak and we're heading out towards the 222. Uh, reciprocal space is vast and empty. And eventually you're going to see the 222 light up. There it is. And now we're back to the 111. So the kinds of, uh, kinds of signals we're expecting in the upgrade are, are a little bit ridiculous. Um, this is the other version of the problem. The best data set we've ever measured at the beam line um, only saw about, about 62 by 10 to the 12 photons incident on it. And with the expected fluxes we're going to have at the upgrade beam line, that's about a 30 second data set. So I'm going to get the best data set I've ever measured at the current beam line every 30 seconds. Um, again, assuming everything works. And so, so we're going to have this flood of data, a data set that's an all night data set becomes a 30 second data set. And we got to try to keep up with them in phasing or you're just going to fall you know, terabytes behind really fast. Um, so I think that was what I wanted to say. Usually I'm at meetings where I'm looking for people to come as users, but I'm here actually asking for help. So if you guys want to, want to work on any of these problems or talk about them, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>